What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the quarantine zone again. And this time we are here with Tim Ellis. Thank you so much for being here, man. It's great to talk to you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today. Um, you know, I spoke to you in the earlier days of Heavy New York back when I was a, what they call a SoundCloud journalist. And uh, But, um, you know, you have this new EP out, Death is Everywhere. Great EP. Yes. Were, were you going into this with maybe like a different mindset than what you've done with Netherlands and all your other previous projects? Or has there always been like a usual method behind the madness that applies to all creativity? In this case, it's a similar method in terms of me just kind of like sort of like the blank canvas of just messing around with ideas. And uh, in this case, like I didn't have a they, they, this collection of songs ended up skewing a little more like pop and a little so a little quirkier. It's not quite as heavy. It's not quite as you know it's heavy instrumental wise, but in terms of the vocals and the the vocal style and the kind of a uh, some of the other instrumental choices, it ended up feeling a little quirkier and like a little less like Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And so then I ended up skewing it. It could maybe at a certain point it could have gone another way, but I ended up skewing it towards a solo project. And then once it kind of revealed itself as that, I was like, oh, okay. In a way, the funny thing about Netherlands and uh, it's a little like the whole thing about me, I think sludge and hard rock and kind of post metal kind of, uh, you know, the genre itself, it's more formal. Like there are, you know, there, it's not that there are rules, but they're closer to being rules. Whereas with the solo stuff, I just don't give a shit and I can just do whatever. I just, it's more freewheeling or something, you know? Yeah, it's more um, liberating. But yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question. So yes and kind of, yes, yes and no, but you know, I just, I just, it sort of just happened that way. Being that this is an EP with just four songs, could this maybe serve as like a good first taste or maybe like a good little uh, preview of the direction that your solo work may be going into in the near future? Uh, kind of. Well, I mean, in this case, I would say, uh, in a, in some ways, yes. And, and, in other ways, like, uh, I would say yes. In, in, in a, there's another collection of songs that I'm working on that are kind of in a similar sort of like super hard rock, like kind of pop hard rock kind of vein. Um, but I'm also d d working on since last summer, I've been working on like a super sort of like old school hip hop album, which is sort of like deep electro kind of old school funk and hip hop. And I'm calling it a bunch of my weirdo all-star friends to sing and play on it. And so uh, uh, for whatever it's worth, that one actually is going to be, just because it's dance music, it's actually probably going to be a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it'll probably have the ability to kind of like cross over with a larger group of people. Not that that's why I'm doing it, um, so the answer is, but the, in the short term, yes, the answer is yes. The next collection of solo stuff is going to be similar in terms of genre and tone to Death is Everywhere. You really but are, oh, Go ahead. you really are no, a ahead. jack of all traits when it comes to different genres and stuff. And do you almost feel that maybe like the different sounds that you explore sonically is almost like expressing a different side of who you personally are? Or do you feel that you are kind of like the same person regardless of what style you're doing? Um, well, I mean, in, in a way, like, uh, the, uh, uh I, I think that there's some, there's some musical and sort of thematic threads throughout all of it, even the, you know, I think there's a certain type of, uh, uh, musicality that all of my music has, but, uh, it's varied enough that you maybe if you didn't know that you probably would have no idea that a lot of this music was even made by the same person. But for me personally, yes, it's all like, uh, I just have a varied I've got hugely varied tastes and interests and that uh, uh, over the years I've just uh, I haven't been afraid or, or somehow inhibited from exploring them even though it's sort of uh, on certain levels it's kind of like a marketing nightmare <laughs> <laughs> it's a branding nightmare because it just sort of doesn't give people en enough of a channel if I can just to hang on to well you're damned if you do and damned if you don't if you're all over the place people say that you're directionless you don't have an identity but if you're consistent and do a similar thing every time people would say you're repetitive and you don't try anything new so I think just going with your gut instinct is always going to be the right answer exactly we're all going to die anyway so I'm yeah. just going to follow follow my thing <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> but do you almost do you enter your songwriting process with like a preconceived idea usually or is there kind of like a lot of of trial and error and experimentation that determines the outcome all seat of the pants it's all it's all improv it's all trial and error it's all improvised 
like sometimes there's it's rarer when I come up with like a narrative or lyrics or something where they kind of reverse engineer a song from like a theme or from a uh, like a title or something. But the much larger majority of the time, I'm just making shit up as I go along. Mm -hmm. And then like I usually I often because I'm a, I do. Well, it depends. Most of the time I do drums first because I usually try to come up with like a certain sort of rhythmic pattern, like a bed or a groove or something or some kind of rhythm drum idea that in and of itself is enough to make you know my own head bob you know and then i try to I try to build a song on top of that so usually if the drums are i tried to come up with a, a really strong i mean that that's 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 most of the time i have no idea what i'm doing other than just like all right let's just try something you know mm -hmm. which has to make it less pressuring because I, I feel like sometimes if you revolve too much around a preconceived idea it could almost like enslave you and kind of like uh not really have the ability to open more doors that's true and like and especially with me now at this point having done so many different types of albums you know i mean sometimes i'll be like oh you know what i feel like making rock music or you know noise or dance music or just our ukulele albums or something i might start up with that going like oh you know what i'll, I'll start it'll it'll the preconceived notion will be determined maybe by the instrument i'm starting on or it just maybe my mood but overall i definitely don't have like I'm, now i'm gonna make this type of thing which maybe i could i don't know it's i don't think i should but I, maybe it, i might I might end up with different uh, albums if I did that. I don't know. Well, I think it's cool because I've seen you, you know, throughout the New York City scene. I would see you at like hardcore shows, but I would see you at more like, uh, you know, art, like avant-garde sort of like, you know, very experimental shows. Like I would see you at a Candiria show, but then I would also see you at a Netherlands show, where, you know, yeah. obviously kidding. But like, a, <laughs> but like, it yeah. seems like uh, you're able to kind of branch out, not into just different styles, but also be involved in multiple scenes as a result. Yeah, I mean, as much as possible, this is one of the, well, you know, when when, when live music culture goes back online, it, you know, if and when it does, it's like one of the great privileges of living in New York is that you can go, uh, you know, whatever. It's like, if, as, and as much as that I'm interested in all these things, I can go, you know, check out some performance or jazz or some dance or straight up gnarly uh, electronic, like punk noise shows, performance art, whatever. So, uh, yes, I, I like to try to, I like to try to keep it as as open minded and sort of expanded as possible, just because it's easy to get kind of like, a, you know, it's easy to get sort of sucked in and into different times into like sort of uh, just getting consumed with one overall world world of musical genre. So I try to keep it uh, keep myself on my toes or whatever. You know? Do you almost feel that like because, you know, you mentioned you come up with themes for certain albums and, you know, as somebody who has seen you play with Netherlands multiple times, um, it's always a great experience. But like, you know, you have like these different ways of portraying yourself. So you almost feel that like you maybe sometimes for lack of better terms, like portray maybe like a character in your music or on the stage or like maybe somebody who you don't personally express in your everyday daily life. Yes. I mean, like in general, like a. The, uh, it's particularly there. There's a few different kind of like performance, uh, uh, kind of identities a little bit that I have, um, as, as you know, when, when I'm in, when I'm doing like I, in the band in, in the Netherlands and also in my solo performances that are, uh, you know, they're more like, uh, they're definitely more unbridled sort of eccentric and they're, I'm like, not as I'm not, I'm just not worried about, I'm not really worried about, I'm not especially hung up primarily on how I look or if it's cool or if I'm like, you know, if it's weird, you know, I'm really just trying to fucking take myself as far out as I possibly can, you know, in turn, not only in terms of the expression, you know, in terms of expression, in terms of vocals, in terms of movement, but also just in terms of, uh, you know, not like a, not just, you know, like even in, like going beyond my own comfort level of what I think is, you know, might look like a performer that like knows what they're doing because i don't, honestly don't know what's going to happen a lot of the time it's not really it's not especially it's not overly contrived so i don't know at the same time that's just how i feel about it someone else might disagree or whatever they might not experience it that way but yes yeah, so overall like uh i at least try to generally take myself and push myself to places where where i'm not just like doing shit i've done before uh, not only musically but also just in terms of how i carry my body and also what i'm singing how i'm singing how it looks everything so i'm trying to you know i try to keep uh, pushing myself 
And having so many albums out, do you almost look at every single album as like a representation of who you personally are? Do you look at every album as a self-portrait in a way? Yes. I mean, like, it's funny to think about. It's like, sometimes when I think about it, it's like the, of course, like anything, it's like my my whole body works sort of in retrospect feels like a, it all, it all like, it all like is narratively, uh, it's all, it's all seems like an obvious evolution of my, my, where I am like at that time, musically, personally, philosophically, artistically, it almost feels like my entire body of work is one album. It's all one giant album, which I thought it'd be funny to actually put out an album that's like 10 hours, 20 hours long, but then there would be no players. There's no way to play it. You would have to, you can do that on a DVD or. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. I love you, Timo, but I will not review that album. I just don't have the time. No one's going to fucking listen to it either. (laughs) Thank you. No, thanks for being honest. I I, I understand. I wouldn't either. (laughs) I just like the idea of like, I mean, these days it's like harder to get even people unless they're your fans to even get through like the first like three songs, you know, the attention span has just been murdered, (laughs) you know, but yeah, no, I mean, I I, just answer your question. Yes. They all like, uh, they all are, you know, it's all totally, they're all very personal and they're all timely and it all, they're all as a, they're all self portrait. Yeah. They're very much meant to be for me to be a a reflective of that. Well, do you find, and I don't even know if this is necessarily like a priority in the songwriting process, but do you almost, uh, find that like the longer you're working on something that maybe the harder it is to maybe capture a moment or like maintain that emotional spark that initially started the creative process uh i mean depending on yes the thing is depending on what it is i mean overall like a you know uh it's it's basically like depending on the, the the genre and the type of song it is a lot of the times like whatever the first wave of like just the first wave of expression of it, the first elements of it, if it's a drum part or if it's some, maybe it's a vocal line, but the first performances, like the scratch tracks, usually are closest to having like that initial fire, like that initial intensity. And then you're like, oh, this is gonna be great. And then you kind of maybe redo a lot of stuff or add layering stuff. And then you kind of get farther and farther away from the original sort of spark, as you said. so I think the challenge at this point, having done it so many times, is to just to be able to know, like, oh, I'm I'm losing it, or I've lost it, and to actually like start, sort of partially start over again, or only like take the okay, like I've completely like lost whatever was fucking exciting or even interesting about this song, and to go back in time and be like, oh, okay, like what what was I trying to say, like in the first five minutes of this, and to see if I can uh, even find that if it's still there or to kind of start from there again. But yes, especially with Pro Tools and the the, the super editing and maybe the godlike uh, overdubbing programs, it really becomes easy to get like, totally get, go deeply into the weeds with like sounds and EQing and processing and effects and and like a million tracks when uh, the, tra- the, the I think the, uh, the challenge is to, is to be able to know when something is good and to work on that or to know when to stop especially when you have so many options endless endless options yeah well that brought me into my next uh, question which is the most difficult question how do you know when a song is done you just um you know uh the thing you know the because usually i know this sounds extremely corny but i think it's actually or it sounds a little hokey but like the song itself will sort of tell you it'll like you your your perception of it in that moment it'll kind of be like you have to you have to, I think you have, one has to have enough practice to know, to know when to stop, you know, and to actually, you know, like know, know that it's like, maybe it's as close as it's, you know, it's like a very, very, it's like a Goldilocks moment where you're kind of like, oh, this is probably as close as I'm going to get right in this moment to actually being able to leave something alone in such a way that you don't feel like it's unfinished, you know, or that it's like just uh, not amazing or, uh, you know, that, that for me, there's the, uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, I feel like I, I don't want to, I'm not going to like let something go until I think just for me anyway, it's totally subjective. I'm not going to like stop working on something until I think it's fucking rad until it's fucking amazing because things in my, if I've said this before, like, it's like, even when things are really good and until they like blow my mind or make me feel like some kind of sense of like a, a mystery or awe or something, I think they just suck. 
So from my, my own opinion is like, until things are amazing, they suck. Mm-hmm. Like something that's really good sucks until it's amazing. And this is, of course, I know anybody out there might be like, well, we don't like your shit. We think your thing work sucks, which is well, totally their prerogative, you know? <laughs> well, I've always said that art is like, in a way, like, sure, like when we create something, we sometimes think it's amazing, but I almost feel like that finishing a piece of art and think it gets amazing, it's almost like falling in love and expecting yeah. to constantly feel that same exact way every single time like i mean there's albums i listened to the first time i heard it like it was like an epiphany for me like it was like a religious epiphany for me that like just completely brought me an essence of salvation on how much i loved it but now like 10 years later i listen to it and i just want to throw up because i've listened to it so much you know what i mean like has there ever been a time where maybe that amazing feeling that you like had that that has to wane sometimes especially if you look back at your earlier work right for sure, definitely. Like, I mean, like overall, like this. Well, I think one of the sort of like unintended uh, uh, benefits of not having had a record deal, you know, or someone to answer to for the much, much larger majority of my entire recording like ex- ex- existence has enabled me, for example, to like work on something like super grind on it for months or whatever, and then finish it. Maybe you know, back in the day, make some CDs. Maybe make a few hundred CDs or something like that, and sell stuff. And then also put it online. But then, like a year later, be like, listen to it. Be like, oh, you know what? I'm going to fix that vocal line or whatever, so I can recall stuff, which is a little obsessive. I know many artists would be like, that's maybe not the most uh, progressive or the most enlightened way of operating. Um, but no, o- overall, like, I can for whatever it's worth, with only there's very few exceptions, like. Uh, do I actually sort of regret where I want to like, where I cringe? There's only, I don't think there's hardly anything where I actually cringe at my own work. I mean, actually that's not true. There's a lot of stuff that I think, I wish it was a little cooler or something. I just wish it made me think it was cooler where it seems kind of nerdy or just not as cool as I, I, I thought it was at the time. But overall, I pretty much, uh, you know, but then, then that's fine. That's just normal. It's like looking back on your life. There's a lot of things that I own, you know, just as a person, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, I just sort of fumbled that one or I thought I was smarter or wiser or cooler than I actually was, which is just a, I think one of the, you know, just one of the qualities of even aging at all. But uh, so yeah, in, in general, like, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I, whatever, I, I'm actually stand by most of my work. I, thankfully I'm actually, I don't want to like recall half of my half of my catalog, or whatever. I'm pretty proud of most of it. You know? And 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 that's awesome that you and that's really good that you like have confidence in your work because in the fact is we went going back to the question where I asked if it's a representation of who you personally are. I mean, art is life, and I feel like it's an extension of who we personally are. So it's going to grow and develop with us. You can't like you know, look back at earlier work and not feel good about it because it doesn't, it's not on par with the current work that you're making, but because that's just who you were at that time. There's really nothing you can do about it, you know? Yes. No, I know. I mean, the, the funny thing is, is that especially now where everything, there's like a paper trail and like, you know, and that, that every, everything, every, everyone's entire life is sort of relatively easily accessible, you know, online that, uh, I think on some psychological level, it's easier to, uh, sort of be reminded of your mistakes, you know, or be reminded by other people. Yeah, I'm glad you know? that I'm glad that they didn't have recording in the days of like Beethoven or Mozart or like Bach because everything they had was excellent, but I'm I hope I'm glad they didn't leave as much of a paper trail. No, you know. No, I know. I mean like I think there's some balance to be struck between being reasonable and sort of being uh, forgiving to some degree of your, you know, one's foibles or their like kind of, you know, whatever their flaws and their past. At the same time, for me, I'm like a. I also. Part part of what drives me is the need to actually, uh, uh, whatever to keep the bar, in my opinion, super high, so that whatever every next thing I do is at least as good or better. You know, I got to beat myself, and so in that respect, it's like a, there's kind of a ruthless self criticism and self appraisal, which I think can be unhealthy and probably is unhealthy in some ways. But it's also for me, it's the thing that actually drives me to to like never get complacent and actually really at least try to keep kicking ass as hard as I did every time, which for me on a, just on, in terms of my experience is personally harder because I've made like almost 40 albums at this point. And so, uh, it's impressive. You know, so it's, yeah. I mean, so I, I, it remains to be seen and obviously you're like that's just Ste- my, tr- you're like the Stephen you know. King of metal. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, 
like I would, if anybody, whatever, it's a, I, I would like to say that uh, anybody that even like decided to, to investigate my weird world of music would probably find something re rewarding because there's a lot of really cool stuff, I think, you know, a lot of really super weird, varied, very personal. But there's no, there's, and there's no, I mean, in my opinion, there's hardly, there's no filler. There's not really any fad on it at all because I'm in a fucking insane perfectionist and I'm very meticulous. And, but then again, you know, different strokes, whatever. <laughs> and, and I couldn't agree with you more. And the final, uh, I have two more questions for you, actually. Um, but you mentioned that sometimes there is a theme revolving around um, your music and your craft. Um, has Is there like maybe like a lot of research that goes involved in coming up with themes? Or do you consider every part of your catalog to almost be like strictly personal? Or is there maybe kind of like external maybe historical commentary or even scientific or political or you know just external inspiration in general that could also influence the music as well or do you just look inward no i mean it's definitely i mean it's kind of in a way it's a sort of a, it's like an oscillation it's an it's a kind of combined it's like inward you know like a, you know it's the pro it's like processing whatever's going on with me personally and then combined with my voracious appetite for books and movies and ideas and art and philosophy food culture like i'm a pretty uh you know i'm a pretty uh i am a voracious reader and so uh you know more and more especially i don't know they, they, so yeah it sort of depends like there's i haven't written i made a bunch of instrumental albums which obviously can't they're not explicitly they don't have any verbal um, they don't actually have any written narratives but then uh you know, more and more as I've gotten older, like, uh, you know, I've, I think I've gotten a little more, uh, uh, like, explicit, like, open about, like, talking about certain political things or, you know, without being, like, too heavy-handed or too literal, you know. But uh, it's but it's basically both. Some of the stuff is very much more very autobiographical just in terms of just some whatever documentation of my whole frame of mind musically and personally. And other things are more, like, direct comment, commentary, you know. The Netherlands stuff is a sort of more closer to like a punk rock band or a hardcore band, even though there's a lot of humor and sort of cryptic poetry, poetics and stuff too. I'm more, uh, I'm more explicitly uh, responding to the world in, in the band. Really? Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because, I mean, I saw Netherlands numerous times. You were the first band I saw at Lucky 13, actually, um, which is I... my favorite bar ever. And um, it's funny, too, because, like, when I first saw you, I mean, I didn't know what to characterize it, which I think was amazing because I feel like, you know, at out all these elements. But, you know, and then seeing you play with, like, Candiria and, you know, like being involved in like you know a lot of punk hardcore stuff but the first time i saw netherlands i almost saw like a little bit of ministry influences there or maybe some industrial inspiration there yeah there's some there's some of that tonality also also because of the gnarly synth bass yeah you know and some of that kind of droning there's some droning gnarly kind of wall of synthesizer stuff that happens you know but for sure, yeah. I mean, some of the newer stuff, some of the new stuff that's about to come out is actually more, it's a little less, uh, it, it's more uh, It's more like a kraut rock, almost like super gnarly synth noise rock, as opposed to metal or, or like super hard rock kind of tonality. But then there's also, we made another record with Kurt Blue, which is also coming out sometime like this year, which it actually is, sounds more like a doom or like a sludge, super sludge doom album um but so yeah that, that's sort of we there's again this is even with netherlands it's sort of like there's a lot of different kind of shit that we have done and that we i will continue to do and i look forward to hearing it and uh before we go that just led me into the final question is there just anything else that you would like to plug uh in terms of netherlands or any of the projects that you're involved with i know you are a creative mastermind this is the time for creativity with all this isolation and everything like that i'd imagine that we're going to get a lot of music from you uh in any project just because of all this right true i'm i'm on my whole production line is like backed up <laughs> i i mean truthfully i mean it's sound, i'm making a joke about it but it's kind of true it's like i kind of have too much music done i have too much too many finished albums in the can you know uh but for the time being that there's the kerpaloo record which is also we're gonna we're gonna shop around we're gonna pitch it to various people and then there's another that's a full album and then there's another ep both of which i'm gonna probably start to start actively trying to find homes for allies or whatever um later in the spring and the summer um in the short term though i uh 
there's this uh, this club called the Footlight. This foot this is collective of, of Great artists place. like um, in Bushwick that just they just recently recorded a live performance, and that that actually goes live today. I mean, today is Monday, March fifteenth. Um, that's going to be available to rent or purchase via pay per view um, via their Vimeo channel. But it's uh, it's also pro recorded. Looks beautiful. It's a thirty minute show, and plus there's behind the scenes. There's some interview footage and also some other behind the scenes stuff. But that's an excellent just a beautifully recorded, mixed and mastered sounding live performance of us playing. And so if that could be posted in the show, in the comments, something that would be ideal. Awesome, thank you. And uh, the Footlight's a great place. I was there for a show uh, back in 20, I wanna say 2017 or 20, yeah, 2017 I was there and it was a great, great place. They're still they're still alive, thankfully, and making cool, doing cool shit. That, is so relieving to hear and uh best of luck to every venue that's out there but thank you so much timo everybody timo ellis be sure to check out the brand new ep death is everywhere this is alex from heavy new york we will see you next time